And now for something completely different. Forget everything you've been told by others before. Get ready for the real deal. The full story. Real talk about money, markets, life. Now, it's The Real Investment Show with Lance Roberts. Presented by RIA Advisors. And welcome. And welcome to this morning's edition. It's back to Monday already. I don't know what happened to the weekend. Actually, I'm not quite sure what happened to the first seven months of the year. So yeah, this is the beginning of August already. So my wife and I were talking about last night, just sitting there going, well, get you going back to school. Uh, time to get off the Christmas trees. So this is, Told you. Told this is you. how fast stuff is going. I mean, it is yeah. literally August and, and right around the corner, it's going to be the end of the year. I don't know where this year went, but I guess, you know, all the stuff with COVID just kind of it took it went away. by while we were hunkered down. I, I guess so. You know, you don't uh, go outside, you miss it. Uh, the, exactly right. Uh, you know, so interestingly enough, though, uh, over the weekend there was an interesting article out talking about fire. So, so first of all, uh, lots of conversation this morning that we've entered a new phase of the virus, which is now just more widespread cases. And now the good news is, is that the infection rate seems to be tapering off here a bit as we get into August. And um, that's kind of what was hoped was going to happen. Um, of course, we're getting ready now on the about the end of the month. We're going to start to go back into the flu season. So now we're going to have that to deal with. But um, the number of deaths have been uh, still ticking up here. Now, one of the interesting articles over the weekend, though, and this is going to be one of the big challenges, is that an immunity has been given to drug companies to produce a vaccine. Now, what does that mean? Well, normally when a company produces a drug and they, they have liability for it. So if down the road you grow a third foot uh, from taking the drug, well, you have an ability to go, you know, uh, sue the company. We've seen this over the years, right? You know, the FinFin cases, the, uh, we've seen it with a variety of different drugs out there. If you took this drug, um, there were class action lawsuits brought against the companies that manufactured that drug that, cr- that caused harm in some manner to the people that they prescribed it to or gave it to, right? So now what this, what this immunity does is basically guarantees that if you take a vaccine for COVID-19 and you suffer an adverse side effect from an untested drug, well, you can't go sue the company, right? You've got no recourse in this manner for that. So I think that's interesting from the standpoint that, you know, for a lot of people, again, we're trying to rush these drugs into development. We, we haven't really spent any time testing them. We're kind of skipping phases of, of the normal process of bringing a, a, a drug to fruition. And this is one of the reasons that people, um, you know, they don't understand why our drugs cost so much in the U.S. is because we do all the R&D here, right? We do all the research and development years of development testing to bring a drug to market and then we sell it to other company countries who don't have those R&D costs to recoup so yeah you can get the drugs cheaper elsewhere but we spend historically because of the FDA we spend a lot of time testing and developing drugs to make sure they are safe for human use and we're kind of rushing through that process in this in this you know desire to get a drug and a vaccine to market we're going to bypass a lot of those those processes that we do to ensure safety and now we're going to indemnify the companies that developed the vaccine against using so here's the question just how fast are you going to be going out there to get a vaccine right that's going to be the role who's going to stand up first line and go yeah i'll take it don't mind if i turn into a monkey it's okay um <laughs> oh, and because the flu vaccines have worked so well well th- there's no vaccine for a flu I, you, just what i'm saying exactly <laughs> you, you have treatments but you don't have a vaccine because we still get the flu every year yeah, so yeah. the flu shot yeah yeah exactly uh so but that's the point so this is going to be interesting to watch is that you know getting you know one of the hopes has been to get the economy back up and running to get everything back on track that we'd have a vaccine everybody would take it and we wouldn't have to worry about this anymore but you know this is going to be the real issue of just how many people are going to line up in line to go take something that potentially hasn't really been thoroughly tested yet. It's kind of, I think a lot of people are going to go, I'll just kind of wait and see if Brent dies from it first, and then I'll go take it. If Brent survives, everybody's going to make it. So. And, and what kind of come-ons are the companies going to offer for you to step up and take that shot? <laughs> exactly. Mm-hmm. That's, that's the other thing. <laughs> Buy one, get one free. <laughs> Don't like somebody in your family? Send them over for a V vaccine. <laughs> so... <laughs> we'll see. Well, we'll see. Anyway, 
<laughs> Let's get to the markets this morning. Uh, a couple of other headlines out in the markets this morning. So Microsoft is in talks to buy ByteDance. Now, if you don't know who ByteDance is, they are the company that basically built TikTok, which is this very um, you know, interesting application that has taken the country by storm to allow young girls and boys to dance for six seconds and put it out on the video. I don't, trust me, I don't get it either. <laughs> That's but, entertaining. <laughs> you know, we talk about the attention span of yeah. children now. Here's why. This is why, right? <laughs> Can't get them to read a book, but they can dance for six seconds on video. Could this be considered a Chinese Trojan horse? Oh, it, well, this has been the big concern. So mm-hmm. Donald Trump, you know, President Trump has been uh, threatening to to disband the use of TikTok in the U.S. because of fears over user data that Chinese would be getting. So that's the whole purpose of this acquisition. Microsoft is now in talks to acquire ByteDance uh, to get the U.S. operations of TikTok so they can ensure the safety of the data. We'll see how this works out. But uh, that's one of the big news over the weekend, of course. And that was also kind of what saved uh, Microsoft was down about 2 percent on Friday at the open, um, rallied back late afternoon into positive territory because of that actual announcement and and initial talks. But over the weekend, it was confirmed they are in the process of doing that by the 15th of September. So they've got 45 days to complete this acquisition. Otherwise, Trump is going to start to uh, talk about shutting down operations. So we'll we'll see what happens there. Okay, quick market update here. Uh, the market did rally uh, on Friday, of course, um, uh, after earnings in Apple and Amazon primarily kind of lifted the markets. But again, just pay attention here. We remain really kind of trapped within the top of this trading range here. Uh, we're still on a money flow uh, sell signal, which has been continuing to deteriorate. Now, we are getting fairly oversold here. So if the markets can hold up here and we can break above this resistance, we've got an opportunity for the markets to move higher and potentially even challenge uh, old highs by the end of the year. But you do want to pay attention here because we are getting into a very confined range here. We're getting to a point where we're getting what's called a compression in price. So if the market can break out of this compression to the upside, you're going to get a bigger move higher. Again, potentially challenge old highs here in the markets. A break to the downside, you've got a lot of support between the 50 and the 200 day moving average, which is sitting right below prices right now. Plus you've got this rising trend line, which is also providing support. So lots of downside support right now for markets, which limits downside risk, but a break of this compression to the downside would suggest a larger decline. Uh, five to seven to ten percent over the next couple of months. Uh, again, you need a catalyst here to try to push the markets lower. We'll see what happens. August, September tend to be fairly sloppy months anyway. Low type of returns normally doesn't mean though that's always the case. So again, just really kind of watch here. There's a lot of overhead resistance at this point, so a break to the upside would be bullish for the market short term. And again, uh, kind of really keeping our positions in line. We continue to try to hedge here a little bit of. of risk in portfolio simply because of this downside risk that we have in August and September historically. So again, don't take your eye off the ball completely. Anything can happen. That's always the the issue with the markets. Things can surprise you when you least expect it. But again, the bullish trend really kind of exists here and suggests that markets want to move higher at this point. Um, Again, but as we kind of go forward, we're going to start seeing more economic data. One of the big challenges here we're going to talk about in a second is, of course, what's going to happen out of Congress and particularly over the next couple of months in terms of more UI benefits, more checks to households. That's coming up next. I'm your host, Lance Roberts. Don't go away. You're listening to The Real Investment Show. Questions for Lance later? Ask now at realinvestmentadvice.com. And maybe not. (laughs) And welcome back to the show this morning. It's Monday. Come on. <laughs> go or no go. Exactly. <laughs> uh, you know, after the uh, this whole coronavirus thing is over, it's been a good excuse to keep people away from me. I don't <laughs> want around me anyway. <laughs> Sorry, can't come over. 
Yeah. I don't know what excuse I'm going to use next. I think I'm going to, I'm going to open up an excuse line on our website. So please email me your excuses that are usable for people you don't want to really see anyway. Sorry, I've got to wash my masks out tonight. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> uh, anyway, yeah, we're, we're getting to that point. Um, okay. So um, just talking about a second ago is that you know, one of the things that could potentially kind of derail the market over the course of the next um, you know, few weeks in particular is this ongoing debate in Congress about more stimulus or not more stimulus. Now, there was an interesting chart out this morning, and I think it was in the Wall Street Journal, um, showing the what has been making up personal incomes over the course of the last few months. So from February to June, there's been an increase in personal incomes. Okay. So great. Personal incomes have gone up. Now, where did that personal income growth come from? Right. So you now normally personal income growth growth comes from wages, right? So you get paid more. And of course, personal incomes go up. Uh, what the chart broke down was is it showed out of total personal income that, that is received by a household, um, including wages and uh, you know taxes and these type of things, what all impacts that personal income. And it was interesting because everything that is something you generate personally was negative, right? So wages and salaries, income from other sources, those type of things, all down. Not surprising because of the economy. So we've had this big jump in personal income. Where did it come from? Obviously, UI benefits, checks to households, tax rebates, those type of things, right? So that's what's increased this personal income as of late. Now, the, the reason I'm bringing this up is because this is the debate that's now going on in Washington, which is more $1,200 checks to households more UI benefits, those type of things, right? So we need to keep money flowing into households to, to keep the economy going. And this is where we're hung up at the moment. Now, over the weekend, President Trump had offered to extend the UI benefits for another week so people could keep getting their additional $600 a month, uh, $600 a week check uh, of additional unemployment benefits. Democrats turned that down. They had productive meetings, quote unquote, you, you put hashtags, you know, quote, quotes around that, quote marks around that. They had productive meetings over the weekend, even though uh, both sides are claiming they're nowhere near deal. So the question is, is really what happens coming out of this? There seems to be a consensus right now to send another 12, a round of $1,200 checks to households. So that's encouraging. The other side of this, now, now hold on, back up for a second, because when I say it's encouraging, we'll talk about the other side of this in a second. Okay, so we'll get there. So don't get too far ahead of me. The other side, of course, is now the debate over the unemployment benefits. The contention over these UI benefits is that it's incenting people not to go look for work because they're making more money being unemployed than they were getting paid at work. And... This is particularly for the case for the majority of the jobs that were lost going into this were in lower wage paying jobs, such as, you know, retail work, restaurant work, bar work, that type of thing, where their wages were not necessarily that high. So when you give them their unemployment benefits plus an additional $2,400 a month, they're living large, right? So this has been a big impact to what we've seen in terms of increases in personal spending. Retail sales have all been much better than expected because of this additional impetus into the economy. Now the debate is whether or not to extend that again. So the Democrats want to right now extend, you know, continue to give people $600 a week through the end of the year. Get you through the election. The Republicans want to tailor that back to 70% of income. So that would take roughly that $600 a week or $24 a month and pull that back to about $400 a month. So there's a, there's a big differential there, right? So if you extract that much capital from the economy, you're going to have a slower economy going forward. So, and again, in order just to maintain 
the ec- the economy, you have to do what we did previously. So, you know, if I give the economy a trillion dollars, I'm going to get a trillion dollar bump to activity theoretically. So if I don't, if so, if I only do five hundred billion the next time around, I'm going to have a reduction in economic growth. If I do another trillion, I only have the same amount of growth. So my growth becomes zero over the course of the next quarter. So again, because we measure measure growth on a quarter over quarter basis or a year over year basis, right? So in order to keep economic growth going, and this is a key point here, is I've got to keep increasing the, uh, the amounts of money I'm injecting into the economy. So I wrote about this on Friday. I actually have an article on the website. It's it's talking about universal basic income because that's what we're talking about here, right? So we are supplying income to households. It's a universal basic income. Everybody is getting it. And when they get it, they spend it. Now, here's here's the thing. So if we look at this on a year, we measure GDP growth on a year-over-year basis, right? So what is our GDP this year versus last year? It was up 2%. That's how we measure it, right? So we had 2% growth year over year. So the problem with UBI is, is that once I inject the a trillion dollars into the economy, I've got to do more the next time to keep getting economic growth. Because if I don't, my economic growth remains the same on a year over year basis. Now, we won't even talk about the problems with increasing debt. We'll talk about that in a minute. But the point here, and this is the challenge now for Congress, and it was interesting because I had a congressman reach out to me over the course of the weekend asking me to potentially get on a panel to talk about sound money. And this is an interesting point because it's great conversation, but actually doing something about it is entirely a different story because nobody really wants to do anything about creating sound money or reducing the debt because of the pain that's involved to do it. I mean, just like we're talking about now with this additional household distributions, right? Another trillion dollars of government debt, another trillion dollar increase to the deficit because we have a decline in revenues now, which means that everything that we're doing is coming out of debt and leading to a bigger deficit. But what's the choice, right? This is, this, this is the belief that we all have. What's the choice? If we don't supply the money to households, oh my goodness, we're going to have a big recession. People are going to lose their houses. People are going to, uh, you know, they're going to go bankrupt. They're going to lose their, you know, their debt will, we'll, you know, they'll default on their debt. Lots of negative consequences, right? If we don't do this. If we don't supply the income, if we don't supply the additional money, we're going to have economic fallout. That's absolutely true. But that's the consequence. If you want to start resolving the debt issues, you've got to allow the system to function. One of the mistakes that we made back in 2008 was is that we started these programs called HAMP, HARP, all these other things, which was designed to keep people in their homes so that they wouldn't lose their home, right? We don't want people to lose their homes. That's a terrible thing. But here was the problem. We kept people in homes in areas where there was no work. We locked them into their homes. So this was particularly the case in in cities like Detroit and others where there was a lot of economic devastation because of the fallout. So now we've locked people in their houses and now they're immobile. They can't move from that house to somewhere where there's work to where they could get reestablished. So instead of allowing them to default on their mortgage, get out of the house and move somewhere and rent an apartment and go back to work and start over... We locked them in their homes and we exacerbated that problem long term. So this is the problem, is that there's not a free lunch in any of this. And we'll talk about some of the debt issues when we come back. 
but there's not a free lunch. At some point, you've got to be willing to say, and look, this is a horrible thing to say, and don't get me wrong. You know, I don't want, I don't wish ill on anyone, but we all make choices, right? We make choices about how much debt we carry. We make choices about what we engage in. We, we have personal responsibility in these issues. And sometimes the best opportunity for someone is to allow the system to work, to file for bankruptcy. Nobody cares about bankruptcy anymore. You file for bankruptcy. It used to be a terrible thing back in the day. You know, you couldn't get a loan for 10 years if you had filed for bankruptcy, right? Nobody cares anymore. After the financial crisis, like, oh, you filed bankruptcy? Yeah, no big deal. We understand the financial crisis. Here's more credit. Nobody cares anymore. But what the bankruptcy system and the foreclosure system and those things allow for is to alleviate the debt and the burden on someone so they have the ability and the opportunity to start over. And guess what? Investors, these are the people, we're not really protecting the little people, right? This this whole game that we're doing is not about helping the little guy. This is about protecting Wall Street and making sure the investors, the pension funds, the hedge funds, all the people that made billions of dollars roping people into houses they couldn't afford, that they don't lose money. So the question is, is really, who are we trying to help out? Be right back. Real Investment Show podcasts are now available on iTunes. Listen any place, anytime at iTunes.com. So it's more 6:35. So, just a minute ago, we were just talking a little bit about <laughs> you know all these bailouts and everything that we're doing. And look, I mean this this is the this is the new world we live in, right? We we now live in bailout nation, which is uh, I'm swiping a title off a book, but you know it's it's that idea, right? So we can't allow anybody to fail, so we have to bail them out, and that's just the way it is. And, and, you know, it's there's consequences to that. Slower economic growth, more debt, more deficits, slower economic growth, more debts, more deficits, slow economic growth. You know, it's, it's that type of thing. I mean, you're not going to have the economy that we all dream of because of the things that we're doing. There, and again, as we've said before, there's no free lunch. But it doesn't mean that you're not going to see with enough money, <laughs> you're going to see some rebounds. So we just had quarter two GDP come in, and on an inflation-adjusted basis, it printed about 30, 38% lower. So now this is for the quarter, but you annualize that out. So, you know, that's 38% annualized. Pretty big drop. I mean, it's one, it's one of the largest, not the largest, but it's one of the largest declines in GDP in, in history. So pretty dramatic. Um, particularly when you consider the markets, you know, about a percent from all time highs. So <laughs> you have the stock market doing just fine, the economy, not so much, and it's all fine and dandy. But, you know, the general consensus is now is that, well, it's just a, it's an, it's an anomaly because of the virus and it's going to go away. In fact, next quarter, we should have some record economic growth. Now, right now, estimates are all over the board. But I wanted to do some math with you this morning. I know nobody said bring a calculator. Nobody said that you'd be involved with math this early in the morning. Don't worry. You don't have to. There's no test after this. We'll just simply talk about this. But there's there's a wide range of estimates that the economy could be up as much as 12 to 20 percent in the third quarter. So right. So Q2 down 40, Q3 up 12 to 20. That's pretty amazing. Question is is does it get us back? to where we need to be. So I did some work in this weekend's newsletter. It's on our website now. So if you go to realinvestmentadvice.com, click on the newsletter link. We actually talked about this a bit because this is something that we haven't seen in this generation for the most part. Unless you were born back during the Depression and there's a few of you left, God love you for hanging on. Um, you you know what we're talking about, but for everybody else, no, have never seen anything like this. So I use the Atlanta Fed. So the Atlanta Fed 
produces what they call GDP Now, which is a real-time economic activity tracker. And they make estimates on what, based on current economic activity, they make estimates for the next quarter. Right now, they're estimating about a 12% increase in the economy in the second quarter. So we're just going to, whether you think it's 20 or 12, doesn't matter. It's, we got a number. So let's just work with that number. So then we extrapolate that out a little bit, right? We say, okay, well, what about fourth quarter? Let's assume that we have another 7% increase in, in economic growth in the, the fourth quarter. And then let's assume we have another jump in, in economic growth in the first quarter of 2021 of, say, another 11%. So now, on a cumulative basis, we just added 12 plus 6 plus another 11. So, you know, now you're talking about, you know, almost 30% growth, right, in three quarters. So you have a 38% decline and a 30% increase over the next three quarters. What does that get you? Right. So the question is this. When do we get back to normalcy? Right. When do we get back to an annual growth rate where we're growing at the rate we were pre pandemic, which was not great, but we were growing at about two percent? Well, see, this is the interesting thing about math and numbers and where we get lost in things. Because if we have a 38% decline, and then we have a 12% advance, a 6% advance, an 11% advance, now you would think with that that now we're, we're back to, to really, you know, cooking, right? Problem is, is that you still got a negative 3% economic growth rate at that point, even after those advances, which is still one of the deepest economic recessions that we've had going back to 1950. And this is the real problem that we've got going on in the economy. And that's assuming that everything just works out fine and dandy and that we don't have another resurgence of the virus, that, you know, we don't have any other type of economic event going along and that all this debt and deficit that we're issuing doesn't impact us in any way, right? I mean, this is really kind of the optimistic scenario here that over the next three quarters, we're still in a recession, technically. Now, a lot, look, a lot of things can happen. Numbers are going to change. And, but here's the point. The, the point I want that we're trying to make here and the thing that we're discussing here is that the amount of economic weakness that we have currently is not just simply going to go away overnight. And the bigger problem, as we discuss in the, the newsletter, and I, again, I kind of encourage you to read this part because this is the important thing. And we don't really realize this because it's, it's, it's like the old story about a frog boiling in water. Now, that, that's actually a false story, by the way. <laughs> a frog really does realize he's getting boiled alive, and he'll try to get out. Just saying. <laughs> but the theory is, is that, you know, this is what's going on. So what people don't realize is that prior to 2008, the economy was growing at a long-term growth trend going back to the 1940s. The trend, the, 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 the growth trend of the economy from the 1940s until 2008 was about 3.3% annually. Not great, not bad, pretty good, right? After the financial crisis, that growth trend dropped to about 2.2%. So over the course of the last decade, we've seen slower economic growth, lots of conundrum, you know, lots of conundrum by the Federal Reserve is like, I don't understand why we can't get stronger economic growth. But next year, we're going to get economic growth. And next year, we're going to have inflation never occurred because of the debt. Nobody can figure that out yet. But that's what it is. It's the debt and the deficit. Now, though, because of the amount of debt and deficit that we've added, and you contribute to this idea, this this resurgence in growth that we just talked about, we actually never get back to where we were previously. So once we get back to a normalized growth trend of 2 to 2.5% two annually, the exponential growth trend of this is going to drop to about 1.75 to 1.5, below 2%. And so we're going to be growing at even a slower rate of economic growth going forward because of the debts and the deficits. So this is the problem. This is what we talk about in, in this weekend's newsletter. Now, you put on top of this the other problem <clears throat> to this, which is the massive increase in the debt and the deficits, and you've got a slower rate of economic growth, which means that you have less revenue 
coming into the economy or into the country. Prior to the financial crisis, we were, or, or, sorry, let me rephrase that. In 2019, prior to the pandemic crisis, we were using about 95 to 98 cents of every tax dollar coming in just for Social Security, welfare, and interest on the debt. We are now in excess of 100% of that just for those issues. Everything else that we spend comes out of debt, which means that now we're in the trap because just to sustain payments on the mandatory basis, Social Security, welfare, prescription drug benefits, interest on the debt, we will have to go into debt every single time just to fund that. And then everything else that we spend is now on debt as well. So now the debt ball has now started because you can't create enough revenue coming in to even sustain your mandatory welfare programs. Now this puts the welfare programs at risk and all kinds of other stuff. But this is the consequence of these actions that we've chosen. We've talked about this on the show before, but here's the problem that with universal basic incomes, the idea with checks to households and, and, and more stimulus checks and all this is that it increases the problem that's leading to the long-term degradation of economic growth and prosperity. So this is what I was saying earlier. At some point, you gotta pick a, gotta pick a fight. And you've got to pick the fight that you want to win, ultimately. And I'm not sure that the choices we're making are the actual way to win that fight. Be right back. Get daily investment news you can use. Delivered at the speed of the Internet. Sign up for the Real Investment Report now at realinvestmentadvice.com. Let's get into some headlines for the day here. A couple of things going on. Uh, interesting story out this morning. It says you may be able to use your Roth IRA to fund a home purchase. Is it a good idea? The answer is no. <laughs> Let me help you out with this. No, it is not a good idea to fund a home purchase. Why? Because we've talked about before, a home is an expense. It's a liability. It's not an asset. So if you take what money you've saved up for retirement and then use that to buy an asset or to, to buy a house, which is now going to be an ongoing expense, now you've got nothing left to retire on, which is the biggest problem that people have right now is that they don't have enough money saved up to retire on. And when we take a look at people over the age of 50 and, and people heading into retirement, the dependency rate on Social Security is rising on an annualized basis. So no, do not use your retirement account to go buy a house. It's not a good investment. We've talked about this before. Owning a home is not an asset. Here's the, there, I'll give you two quick reasons why. A lot of people are like, yes, it is. It's an asset if you're using it to rent out to other people. Okay, Now it's an asset because it creates income. If you buy a house to live in, you now take what money you had that was growing and earning an income for you, and now you put it into something that does not. Because if, if, if you eventually need income, the only thing you have to sell is your house and where you're going to live, right? So plus with a house, you've got maintenance, upkeep, expenses, taxes, HOA fees, which is you know, eventually why I'm going to move to somewhere where there's no HOA. <laughs> I love that, that Geico commercial. With Cynthia, mm -hmm. where she comes down, chops down the the mailbox because it's too, it's just so over legal. <laughs> That's my neighborhood. <laughs> Cynthia lives in my neighborhood, <laughs> so I've got stories about HOAs. <laughs> Another day we'll have we'll have we'll have HOA day. HOA day. <laughs> HOA day here on the show. I'll tell you my stories. Anyway, point is is, is don't make a bad mistake. Right? It sounds good that you can do these type of things. But the whole point of having a retirement account is you're supposed to not be able to touch. In fact, I'm going to do a, an interview with Fox News this morning. Been lots of talk lately about, you know, should you contribute to a 401k plan? Yeah, you should. Why? Because it's for savings. Basically, it comes out of your paycheck. It goes in. The problem that most people have, the majority of people have in this country, is they can't save because they can't budget. And so life in, intrudes. It eats up all their money at the end of the month. They can't save anything because there's nothing left. So at least with a 401k plan, it comes out of your check. It goes in there. It may not be the best vehicle, 
but it's at least forcing you to save some money, which is more than most. The average 401k balance is less than a year's worth of savings. It tells you the problem. So don't use Roth IRAs and, and 401k plans for buying a house to live in. Now, it's a different conversation, ultimately, if you're buying rental property to rent. That's a different. That's a, that you're buying an asset that creates an income. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about living in it. Okay. All right. Other headlines this morning. We talked a little bit about the fact that Microsoft is in talks to buy TikTok, which is going to be interesting because they want to, the U.S. or the government actually wants the U.S. to control the data of its users. <laughs> but then there's the whole issue of TikTok and what the other stuff that goes on on TikTok. But we'll. <laughs> Save that conversation for another day. Separate issue. Yeah. <laughs> Separate issue. Um, <laughs> yeah, there, that's that's the whole issue. Uh, anyway, <laughs> uh, again, we talked about the fact that right now, also, you know, the government is in the process to talk in talks now, trying to figure out some extension to getting money into the hands of households, right? So another $1,200 check likely is going to be approved as part of the package. The real the real hang-up here is over the unemployment benefits, the extended unemployment benefits, as well as aid to cities. One of the, the, one of the big arguments is whether or not to provide aid to cities that have spent decades running massive deficits, not being fiscally responsible. And now that they're in trouble, they all want a bailout from the government. And this is one of the hangups between Republicans, and Democrats in particular, is to bail out a lot of these cities. And you know the list and you know the states that have gotten themselves into financial trouble because of years and years of bad financial decisions on part of their governments. And, of course, what's at risk there is municipal bonds, potential defaults on municipal bonds if they don't get a bailout. So, again, this is where we go back to talking about who actually are we bailing out? Are we bailing out the cities or are we bailing out the pension funds and Wall Street that own all the muni bonds? Right. So who are we bailing out here? Really, really, that's the question. Um, so. That's one of those things. And, and so the other kind of interesting headline this morning is, you know, we talked about last week about Kodak. All of a sudden, President Trump comes out and says, hey, let's tap Kodak, this company that makes printers and cameras. Let's tap them to start making drugs under the National Defense Act. Of course, the stocks had a huge spike uh, because of that. And now Kodak is going to become Co Kodak Pharmaceuticals, I guess, <laughs> going forward. But here was a company near bankruptcy, trading at about $2 a share, roughly. Uh, now has new life to it. Well, it's interesting, ADT, which is the security company, provides home security, ADT, they were trading about $6, $7 a share. Today, they're going to be up 100% because Google has decided to buy a stake in ADT. Now, it's interesting because Google already bought Ring, which is these annoying doorbells that everybody has that once you have a Ring, you keep getting notifications from all the other people that have Rings around your neighborhood telling you strange things they see on their porch. I don't care. It's your porch. I don't care what's on your porch. Yes, my wife wanted a Ring. We have one in our house. They're annoying. <laughs> so, but anyway. They're also triggered by small animals. Yeah, yeah, well, you have to, uh, you, what you have to do is you have to refine the visibility of the ring. The so frame. The yeah. frame, yeah. so that it'll eliminate a lot of those. Like, we used to get rings every time a truck would drive past the house. So, <laughs> which, considering everybody in my neighborhood lives on Amazon, happened a lot. That's a so whole other level that's a whole of other annoyance. Issue. Exactly. So, but, I mean, this is an interesting point. So, Google bought ring, and... Google has, you know, their their Google Assistant and, you know, uh, Amazon has Alexa and that type of stuff. So this is the invasion, again, more and more into your house of technology, right? So more and more integration into your house. Smart homes are, you know, a thing. And again, this is, you know, we've been doing this for years, right? I can control all the lights in my house from my phone and, you know, all that, right? So, and the reason we did it is because I've got four kids 
that if I had a nickel for every time, this is my dad, if I had a nickel for every time my kids left their lights on, I'd be a millionaire, right? You could pay your electric bill. I could pay my electric bill. <laughs> so I put smart switches in, all, in my house, control everything on my phone, so every time my kids leave, I push a button on my house and all the lights go off, which is also fun when they're all home, I turn the lights off. <laughs> <laughs> TVs off, <laughs> internet off. It's all on my phone. This is great. So if I want to torture my kids, I turn it off while I'm at work. It's a lot of fun. You should really try it. Do you, so. do, do you still make them work for the Wi-Fi passcode? Yep. Yeah, good. Absolutely do. Yeah. And they they hate me for that, by the way. <laughs> they're it, ma- they're mad at me for a lot of things right now. So because I'm really starting to crack the whip at home. Because because now. They're not going back to school again, mm-hmm. so they're at home. So now all of a sudden, I'm like, okay, well, look, if you're not going back to school, you're gonna start helping your mom around the house. You know, you got a choice. And they're like, well, we have to be online. I'm like, I've watched you online. <laughs> <laughs> That's a whole nother story. We got some friends of ours who are teachers. Yeah, <laughs> we had some long conversations about this whole online thing. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> another story. <laughs> don't get me. Don't get me started. We'll do that one tomorrow. That's my dad. Don't get me started. Here we go. <laughs> and don't make me come back you know, there. You know, exactly. <laughs> that was the, that was the worst. And you remember those long trips you would have oh, yeah. back in the day? Mm-hmm. So all my dad, so invariably, you know, my brother and I are fighting in the back seat. Mm-hmm. You know, he's touching me. He's touching me. You get to look in the rearview mirror. That was all that had to happen. Yeah. <laughs> Once you got to look in the mirror, you stopped because <laughs> you knew what was coming. It's next. like looking at Medusa. <laughs> yeah. No. Yeah. My dad had no problem pulling over the car. <laughs> he just opened up two doors, beat the crap out of you, put you back in the car. <laughs> Keep going. <laughs> Today, that's child abuse. But back then, it was called discipline. <laughs> I don't know where that happened. <laughs> of course, maybe that explains a lot. But anyway, different story. Uh, you know, all these old people are like shaking their head right yep. now. I mm-hmm. remember that. Mm-hmm. All these young people are like, that's child abuse. <laughs> It's, we called it discipline. Discipline. Yeah. And we and turned then, out okay. And then, then Dr. Spock came along and, well, there you go. Yeah. No, I'm not talking about this Dr. Spock. I'm talking about the one. <laughs> the one with the round ears. <laughs> and it wrote the book. <laughs> Just all you Trekkies out there is like, why is he talking about Spock on the radio show? <laughs> anyway, have I burned up enough time yet? <laughs> Almost. Almost. Here we go. Uh, all right. Tease the uh, I was webinar. about to. Okay. We do. Yeah. Because we have, a, we do, all kidding aside, we actually do have a webinar coming up um, Saturday, August the 8th. So that's this Saturday coming up, right? So uh, that's 9 to 11. Uh, or go by the website, get registered. It's right lane retirement. Basically, uh, this is everything you need to know about retirement Social Security, Medicaid, Medicare. Um, when should you take it? When shouldn't you take it? What should you take? How to make withdrawals? Should you do Roth IRA conversions now? All those type of issues, as well as investing, the markets, more. This is Saturday from 9 to 11. Simply go by the website right now. Click on the banner for the Right Lane Retirement Webinar. That's this Saturday coming up, August the 8th, 9 to 11. It really, it's one of our most popular classes. Very comprehensive. If you're even thinking about retiring soon, or gotten laid off, you've um, taken a severance package, need to know what to do with it, NUAs, um, that unrealized, unrealized depreciation. So if you own company stock, an important thing to know, you know, those are all covered in this webinar. So again, very, very comprehensive. It's this Saturday, August the 8th, 9 to 11. Go by the website, realinvestmentadvice.com to get registered. And of course, we'll be back tomorrow morning. Uh, we'll talk about how the markets did today, what you need to know about your money. That's tomorrow. And of course, we'll talk a little bit about technically trading Tuesday, which is what we're going to have out in the morning. Get by the website today for our latest updates and more. Why cash is an important hedge for your portfolio. That's on the website now, realinvestmentadvice.com. We'll see you tomorrow. It's a rich man's world.